If you'd like to turn to, just for a moment, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. The reason I'm doing this tonight is because I, I just wanted to encourage us. Someone asked me last week or the week before, what will be the signs that we have crossed or are crossing into the promised land that God has brought to the church? Isaiah 61. There must be observable signs as we go into the promises that God has given us. As we begin to enter a season of fulfillment. And there are signs. And these signs all align with what we read in Isaiah 61, particularly the first four or five verses. And if we keep our eyes open, our spiritual eyes open, then we'll see these signs happen as they happen. The first one we read of in the first three verses, the first one is comfort instead of mourning. We'll see that happen. Broken hearts will be bound up as we go on through this passage. Broken hearts will be bound up. People who were spiritually or emotionally wounded will be experiencing healing and restoration. Captives will be released and the bondage, bondages will be broken if you're working your way down. Those held in spiritual bondage of whatever kind, whether through fear that the, the enemy is placing in us, spiritual oppression, will be set free. And here's the thing. This is a sign that we can actually see happening in the church right now. Right now, over these last few months, people have been telling me that they're beginning to feel a liberty that they've never felt before. Hallelujah. They're reporting freedom. Not everyone, but it's beginning. Hallelujah, we praise his holy name. Joy will replace sadness. There will be an atmosphere in the church marked with joy and a noticeable shift from heaviness, sorrow, discouragement, to hope and celebration. This too is beginning to happen in the church. And for this, we thank God. And this is the most noticeable. Garments of praise will replace heaviness. The spirit of heaviness will be replaced by a garment of praise. Instead of weariness or despair, the people will be filled with a spirit of praise and worship. We notice that here. That has been happening over the, the last, since April. That's been happening. Particularly, it's happening, it's beginning to, the volume and the, 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 the energy is beginning to rise even in the services. But after the service is over, my goodness me, there's a, there's a spirit of praise that comes down upon the church. And it has been absolutely marvelous. That is already happening. Lord, may it happen all the more. Then the saints will become trees of righteousness, will grow spiritually, standing strong as pillars of righteousness, firmly rooted in the Lord. And all of these changes will be for the glory of God. 
And then, of course, you go on into verse 4 and verse 5, and it speaks of other things. I'm not going to go through them because it's, it would take too long, but you go through them, and this is what we have to look out for. Well, I hope you're excited, even if you don't smile about it. I hope you're excited because, you see, God is beginning to do something. We're not crossed over. There's so much still to happen. But we've started the journey. Praise God, Zion. We're on the way to a beautiful, beautiful future. God said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He'll do it through the ministry of the word and the ministry of the word as the spirit of God owns it will set the captives free. Oh Lord, do something marvelous, marvelous in our midst. Now if you want to turn back to Joshua. Joshua chapter 4. <coughs> the title of the message tonight is Stones of Remembrance. Stones of Remembrance. We've got to the point now of, in the story where Israel are crossing over. Praise the Lord. They've been on the east side of the Jordan for so long, 40 years. They've been making their way to the Jordan. Now they're crossing over. This is a, a definite moment in the history of Israel. This is defining. They're actually going in. But as we'll see, it's not only exciting that they're actually now going in. This is going to be a great time of remembrance as they look back. They're going to marvel at what God has done for them in bringing them over the Jordan River. But as we think of ourselves, we think of firstly and most importantly, we're going home to glory. And we've been journeying a long time. Some have been journeying a very long time. The day will come guaranteed that every one of the saints will go across the Jordan and will be in the promised land. Hallelujah. What a wonderful thought that is for every single Christian, young or old. We will be with Jesus. And we're going to marvel at him forevermore. We're going to be singing his praises forevermore. We're going to be learning more and more about him. Because even when we get to glory, we're going to have to learn the depths of Christ. We'll know more than we know now, but oh my goodness, eternity will be an eternity of, of discovery. And the more we discover, the more we will worship. And that's coming. But as you know, this whole book so far, in conjunction with Isaiah 61, Matthew 16, 18, this whole book is significant for us here in Zion now. At least I hope I haven't been up here preaching in this way and you don't think that there's something significant about what's going on here and, and what God is saying. If that's how you feel, get it. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I, I really do pray that you, you feel that this is more than just us dealing with, with Israel's history or with the hope of us going home to an eternal glory. 
We have an earthly promised land that God has given, that God has brought to our awareness. And we've just looked at it, Isaiah 61. That's our eternal, that's our uh, earthly promised land. And we're going in. We will begin in under the guidance of God. He's promised it to us that we will occupy it. But just like with Israel, it's going to take faith. It's going to take obedience. And it's going to take a constant remembrance of God's faithfulness. Because there's going to be challenges. And we're going to have to know what God has told us. Someone once preached at a church that I was in. And I don't remember the, the sermon, but that's a thing with preachers, you know. You say things like that. I don't remember the sermon. And you're standing preaching. I'd love to say I remembered the sermon, but what I do remember is that he said, we need to know what we believe. We need to know what we believe. And so as we cross over, whenever that fullness is coming, but the journey as we go in, we're going to have to know what God has said. We're going to have to know what the vision is and keep it before us. A remembrance of God's faithfulness. So, they've passed over the Jordan. It came to pass, Joshua 4.1, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men of the people out of every tribe a man, and command you them, saying, take you hence out of the midst of the Jordan, a stone. They've passed over in obedience to God's word. And God now communicates the next step for Joshua and the people. And that's the way of it. That's the way of it. If you're like me, you want all the steps. Because if I have all the steps, I can then decide how I'm going to take them. If I've got all the, all the information, then I can sit and decide how I'm going to use that information to get over. Whether it be in the church situation or in your own personal life. If you're anything like me, you want it all. It would be wonderful if you had to go into your inbox and God had left a, an email with all the stuff that he wants us to do and where he wants us to go and what he wants us to be involved in. Ah, but would it be wonderful? It would be overwhelming. It would be too much. And so God comes to us and he, he gives us step-by-step step instructions. Joshua, the leaders in the whole nation, had been obedient to the word of God. And now they're hearing God again. The Psalms, Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a, a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Your steps and my steps, Zion's steps, are established by God. God knows where we're going. He knows when we're going to be there. He knows how everything is going to work out in Zion Baptist Church and in your life. There is not a detail that God is unaware of or is unable to deal with. In his mind and heart, already done. But he's only going to reveal it to you and me bit by bit. You see, the people of Israel knew what the big vision was. They were crossing into Canaan. 
They knew the big vision, but the detail would be given at the appropriate time. Exodus 23, verse 30. Now let's go back to verse 29, talking about the enemies that will be in the land, the opposition. He says, I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against thee. <coughs> little by little and little, I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land bit by bit. I'm not going to do it all at the one time, says God. Because if I do it all at the one time, you won't be able to handle the land. You won't be able to take it. It will become unruly and the beasts will multiply against you. So what I'm going to do, Israel, is because I know everything and I know everything that's going to come and I know all the, all the details. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do it bit by bit. And one day, bit by bit, one day you will know that you are in possession of the land because of me. Zion, that's where we're going. And so if it's little by little, if it's bit by bit, if it's one step after another, we need to be grateful for every step. We need to be grateful to God for every little bit that he does. You see, if it wasn't going to be bit by bit, then the vision would overwhelm us. The... In fact, what would happen is the vision would be obscured by the, the intricacies of making our way into the vision. We would get caught up in the detail and we would lose sight of what's ahead. But because God is wise, because God is, is all-knowing, he's given us the vision but in order to keep the vision fresh before us, he doesn't give us all the detail that would bind us up. Hallelujah. We go forward. The heart of man makes his plans. But the Lord establishes his steps. And you know that when you obey the Lord on an issue, and it might even feel like a, a victory for you in that moment of obedience, you've stepped out as God has told you. You know as well as I do, that's when God comes back to you and says to you, now, the next step. Lord, I've just, I've just taken this step. Going to just let me enjoy this step. I mean, this, was, this step that I took was quite a big thing for me. And God says, the next step's bigger. The faith you needed for that step it's going to have to be increased for the next step. That's why he does it little by little. So that we can be equipped for each step of the way. And this should be rising, raising our expectation. This should be causing our excitement to rise tonight. God has it planned, you see, Zion. He hasn't told us into the promised land, open the Jordan, on you go, right? Get it sorted, take possession of it. That's not how God does it. He's given us the vision in the promised land. He's going to part the Jordan because it has to be a miracle. 
but every step of the way, he will be close to us and give us the instructions. So the leaders need to be listening. I need to be listening. But hey, we all need to be listening. We can't get it all at once. Jesus said to the disciples in John 16 and verse 12 that he had much more to say to them, but they couldn't bear it. But he had more to say, but he couldn't tell them because it would blow their minds. God has more to do. God has more to say. God has more to bring. But he doesn't want to blow our minds. He doesn't want to ruin us. He's going to take us over. Step by step. And one day, we will turn around in the promised land. And we'll look back and remember the faithfulness of Almighty God. So that's why Joshua says, or God says to Joshua, take 12 men. One from each tribe. They've all crossed over. The priests are still standing in the middle of the Jordan with the Ark of the Covenant. The people have crossed over. And here's these 12. And Joshua says to them, you have to go back into the middle of the Jordan and each of you pick up a stone from where the priests are standing. Uh, eh? We've just got over. Ah, uh, well, God is sending you back in. Back into the midst. Get your stone and bring it over to the place where you're going to dwell. Take you twelve men, verse 2, out of the people of every tribe a man. Command ye them, saying, Take ye hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priests are standing. Standing firm, by the way. The priests are standing firm. Nothing's going to move them. Go there, get your twelve stones, and carry them over with you to the place where you'll lodge, which is Gilgal. And there'll be more about Gilgal when we get there. Not literally, but when we get there here. These men had been selected already. Do you remember in chapter 3, verse 12? It was a verse that just seemed to be there in its own context. It wasn't part of what was happening. Now, therefore, take ye twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe a man. God had said to Joshua, get the 12 men ready. There's a task. There's a special task for these men. I'm not telling you what it is yet. But there's a special task. Select them. Now that special task is about to be made known to them. The special task, back into the, into the Jordan River, back into the, the river bed, bring the stones out. We don't know who the men were, but they must have been prominent. Faithful men, godly men, For God to give them a special task. Has God given you a special task? If he has, rejoice. I'll tell you this. Every single Christian in here has been given a special task 
by Almighty God that will enable this church to go over the Jordan. If you don't know what it is, then you need to ask him. Because he will give you the detail, as he does here now. But what I wanted to highlight was there was a man from every single tribe. Every single tribe. That includes the two and a half tribes that weren't going to settle in the promised land. They were going to settle on the east side of the Jordan. But still, those tribes had to select a man. Do you see the unity that's been pressed here? You need to be united. We need to be united. This is a sign that the whole nation was involved in this mission. The whole nation was committed to crossing over. Not some of them. Even those who weren't going to live in the promised land. Men had to go from those tribes into the river, get the stone and put it in Gilgal. That's marvelous. We united. As we face going over the Jordan, are we united? We are united. And even those who don't want to go over the Jordan and live in the promised land, well, you still need to go and pick up your stone and take it over. Unity is so important. Go in where these men are holding the ark. My wife, Anne was saying to me last week, or the week before, I think it was last week, that the priests were carrying the ark. The ark was the first into the river. And it was the last out of the river. God went into the river Jordan first, parted the waters, And he stood there until all his people were over. That's why these men had to go and pick up 12 stones from that very place. The very place where God stood. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. We are going to take note of this. So having gathered the 12 stones from the riverbed in front of the priests that were bearing the ark, They carried them to Gilgal, put them down. And there the stones were going to be used to build a memorial. Verse 5 says, take ye up, midway through the verse, take ye up every man of your stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children Ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them. The waters of the Jordan were parted. These stones were going to be a memorial to God. Not simply a a memorial to commemorate that Israel were now in the land. It wasn't to commemorate Israel's presence in Canaan. It was to stir up conversation in generations to come. Reminding them that in order for Israel to be in the promised land, God had to dry up the Jordan River. That's what these memorial stones were all about. 
They were a memorial to the greatness of God, to the faithfulness of God. They were a memorial to what God had done for Israel. What do these stones mean? Oh, let me tell you. Almighty God had called us into this land, but the river Jordan was in flood. And you know what happened? He parted the river. And it was dry ground. These stones have come from the dry ground at the riverbed where God stood. That's a memorial. A memorial to the greatness of the Lord God Almighty. This would have been so powerful a symbol. Because they didn't take these stones from the river bank. They took them from the dry riverbed. And so every time Israel looked at that monument, looked at that memorial, they would be reminded God dried it up. These stones were markers of the greatness of God for every tribe of Israel, for the whole people. They were markers of a work of God that no one in these future generations would know by experience. So they had to be told. And that's why it's so important that we tell the future generations about the greatness of Almighty God. That's why we tell the kids about Jesus, about salvation, about creation, about sin appropriately. That's why we tell them. That's why we have a, a, a time of instruction for the, the, the older folks at, the, at, the, at the, the Bible class, telling them about God, showing them these wonderful things that God has done in the past and reminding them that this God who did all of this hasn't changed. He's the same God. You see, the God who parted the Jordan for the Israelites is the same God who's promised us the land. And he's promised to take us in. And he's promised to open it up for us. The same God. With the same power. The same authority. The same sovereignty. He still cannot be argued with. And so we need to remember, we need to, we need to remember what God has done and what God is doing. And when we get over, mark it. This is how powerful our God was, kids. He parted the river. He did it with the Red Sea. He did it again with Jordan. That's our God. That's your God. You can trust this God. Every time Israel saw the memorial stones that had been laid at Gilgal, they would be reminded they can trust Almighty God. You see, when we go over Jordan, just like the Israelites, the promised land was not a land. It was a land of milk and honey, but it was not a land of ease. There was going to be opposition. There were going to be battles involved as we'll come to as we go through the book. Battles, conflict, opposition. But always victory. Except AI will get there as well. Always faith in Almighty God. 
If God can part the Jordan, he can do everything else we require as we go through and as we settle. If God can cleanse us of our sin and take us home to glory in Jesus Christ, he can do absolutely everything else we need him to do in our earthly lives. Do you believe that? Of course you do. Have you experienced it? Of course you have. Let me ask you this. Do you have memorial stones? Have you marked your Bible? Have you written up your reflections on what God has been doing in your life? That's your memorial stones. It means that every time you look at them, you're reminded of the greatness of God. Emily mentioned this week that she was spending time just in the morning, just flicking through to different scriptures. Isn't it marvelous when you're flicking through or when you're reading in your daily routine, you come across a passage that you've underlined or a passage that you've highlighted. And you're reminded of the greatness of God. And so the future doesn't look as dark or as daunting. Because <coughs> my God hasn't changed. And he's still able to do amazing things. Zion, we look back. And there are some who can look back to memorial stones of the past. It's marvelous to be able to do that. But what are they there for? For some kind of pool? Wishing I was back there? Maybe for some that's legitimate. Or can't we see them as we're supposed to? Motivation to drive us into the future. Because the God of the future is the God of the past. What he was able to do then, he is still able to do. And he will always be able to do. Can't we look at the, at the stones that are built and say, my goodness, the future is so exciting. Because you see, that's the God who's taking us in. So they had to build these me memorial stones, put them in a, a heap. Because you see, God wants us to remember what he's done. He wants us to remember that he's taking us over. And when we get over and get the opportunity, we look back. God wants us to remember his work. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 12, Israel get a warning that God didn't want his work to be forgotten. <coughs> Take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God doesn't want us to forget him. He doesn't want us to forget as we're crossing over when we get there that it was him that did it. It wasn't Israel. Israel would have looked for a way over or a way around. It was God who did it. He took them through it on dry land. Don't you tell me, Israel, that you did this. You're in the promised land because of me. Look at the stones that you took from the dry riverbed. That's how glorious I am. That's how powerful. And we need to grasp that because that's really significant. Because you see, we can very easily take our eyes off what God is doing. 
and we try to polish it up a wee bit. We try to professionalize it. John Piper has a book called Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. That's marvelous. Brothers and sisters, we are not professionals, nor do we need to be. How can you professionally love someone? How can you professionally take care of your brother and sister in a spiritual fashion? Pastor, you're getting paid for this. We don't need to polish it up is what Piper was talking about. We don't need to be slick and cool. If that's still a word that the youngsters use, I don't know. Cool probably means cool now. Just everything suave. Keep it. Our God will take the rough diamond over the Jordan. Our God will use us as we are to get us over the Jordan. We don't need to make the difference. Let God do that. Let God shape us. It has to be him. We don't sit down with our, with our manuals and say, right, what does so-and-so say about this? How do we? Don't bother about what so-and-so says about anything. It's what God is saying. How would they do it to make it better, make it more effective? Away you go. You or me, we cannot improve upon what God is telling us to do. It is not our job to improve it or polish it up. It's our job to obey the word of God. Even, and I'll say, perhaps especially when it seems kind of strange. Go back into the river and get the 12 stones. But if they hadn't gone back down into that, the depths of where they had come from, there wouldn't have been a memorial at Gilgal for the people of Israel to look, turn around and see year after year after year, this is our God. And so when we get over in a rough state, we're going to turn around and we're going to be forced to say, this could only have been the Lord. And it thrills us. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. Psalm 77, 11. Right in the midst of difficult times, the psalmist was able to say that. <sighs> but crossing the Jordan is not the end of the matter. The promised land for Israel would be a place of battle. It would be a place of conflict. <coughs> but oh, the trust. When they put their faith in the Lord and see the victories that God brings them, my goodness me. Yes, the battles will be many, but if faith holds firm, in what God has done, the blessing is going to be abundant. Zion, do you believe this? You see, when we walk through the Jordan with God, when we get into the promised land, when we have our memorial stones, I was going to say Ebenezer stones, but that's a different story. When we have our memorial stones in place, 
we're going to realize that in all these things, we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors through him, through him who loved us. Isn't that a lesson? I was getting excited preparing it because I, I could hear God speaking to my heart. This is for you. Keep your eyes fixed on me. Elders, keep our eyes fixed on Christ. People, keep your eyes fixed on Christ and don't doubt what he is able to do in the crossing and in the land. Have faith. Trust him completely. Because faith is the substance of things unseen. The evidence. The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. I'm hoping to get into the promised land because God told me that that's to happen. I'm hoping that, that God will build his church so that the gates of hell will not prevail against it because that's what God told me. That hope gives me faith that even although we can't see it, it's coming because it's there. So what memorial stones do we have? We're our marked Bibles, our written reflections. Isaiah 61, Matthew 16, 18, Luke 4, 18, when Jesus uses Isaiah 61 for his own ministry. That's why we can say Isaiah 61 is speaking about an anointed ministry. And the reason the ministry will be anointed is because it's the, it's the ministry of Christ, not the ministry of Crawford Harvey. It's the ministry of Christ, not the ministry of Kenny, not the ministry of Robert, the ministry of Christ. It is Christ who is telling us that the captives will be set free and the prisoners will be released. It is Christ that's telling us that the mourning will be comforted. It's Christ that's telling us that there will be praise instead of a spirit of heaviness, that the old ruins will be replaced or restored. It's Jesus that's telling us this through whatever vessel he's choosing to use. Okay. I found this on the web for what vessel is choosing. Dear doctor, don't you hate that? I love technology, but I hate technology. Continue to return to these places in the scripture. But you'll notice that the memorial stones that were placed at Gilgal were not the only pile of stones. If you're using any other version of the scriptures than the NIV, then you will see that Joshua built another memorial. The NIV seemed to say that it was just one memorial. It was two memorials. One was on the land in Gilgal, and the other, as we read in verse 9, Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests, which bear the Ark of the Covenant, stood. And they're there to this day. The people obeyed the Lord and they took the stones and they put the stones where they were meant to. 
And then Joshua went down into the the bed of the river where the priests were still standing and he took 12 stones by himself and he built a memorial to God in the midst of the Jordan. Right there. The one on the land commemorated what happened for future generations. The one in the Jordan commemorated where it happened and how they crossed over. Joshua's memorial wouldn't always be seen when the river came back to flood or when the river began to flow normally those 12 stones wouldn't be seen by any human eye. They would be seen by God. And God would see Joshua's heart. Joshua was telling, if you like, creation. Joshua was telling the river, don't you ever forget that our God parted you. You're no match. Creation is no match. For God. Oh, we could also look at these stones, and I've been thinking about this the last few days. Moses couldn't take the people into the promised land. Joshua had to do that. Moses, as we've noted before, is a symbol of the law. Joshua is a symbol of grace. The law couldn't take them into the promised land. Grace would do that. The 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan was as far as the law could go. And the condemnation of the law was washed over by the Jordan River. The stones on the other side the grace of Almighty God. You cannot take the land by the law. You can only take the land by grace. Your trust in the law is a waste of time. Only grace. Jordan, you can flow and you can flow. You can flow over the law and all of its demands. My home is there where grace is piled up stone by stone by stone. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. We're free from all of that now. What a glorious God is our God. Are you ready to worship him? Are you ready to praise his holy name? Let's look at the reminders regularly and realize that our unchanging God is still able to do all of this. We are going in. Heavenly Father, how we love you tonight. We praise your blessed name. We thank you for what you've done in the past. We thank you for what you're doing. And we thank you in advance for what you will do, for what you've promised to do. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for our Savior. We thank you for the one who secured our place in the eternal glory. And we thank you, Father, that we can trust him as we make our way forward here on this earth. As our journey continues, it continues with Christ. Be glorified in all we'd seek to do, Father. And help us just to keep our eyes fixed on you and to be faithful to your God, to you, our faithful God. Help us to know the wonder and the joy of what you do every day and in this place. 
We will worship you this night because you are worthy of our worship. In Jesus we pray. Amen.